I know this mic is sensitive, so okay, I'll try using it. So thanks a lot, everybody. My name once again, Paul Poy. I'm CEO and co-founder of Airbits. A lot of people know us as a mobile wallet for Bitcoin, which we have been and still are today. And you can download it for iOS and Android. And the focus that I'm going to talk to you today about is kind of the stuff that we've been going through in securing Bitcoin and securing private keys and how we're now leveraging that technology and what we've learned for other blockchain applications. And so we've developed an SDK. Uh, we call it an edge security SDK, the concept of securing data at the edges. So we've been talking about it. Since this is a security platform, uh, I want to kind of go back and kind of revisit what exactly is the paradigm that we're using for data security today. And so today we're fundamentally surrounded by the, the enterprise security paradigm, which especially in the Bitcoin and decentralized space, we fundamentally believe is broken. It is akin to the way banks work. Put all of your value on centralized, globally accessible internet servers, and therefore give yourself potentially many different weak points to attack and compromise data, and also require trust in a lot of third parties and storage providers for that valuable data. And of course, with that model comes all of the unavoidable breaches, and we hear about it even from the largest companies in the world, the ones that have the most resources to try to protect that data. Banks, JP Morgan, large companies like Microsoft. And of course, that always trickles down all the way to the very familiar Bitcoin companies and the exchanges which have repeatedly been hacked, such as Bitfinex. And so the challenge with this enterprise security model is that the incentive is very, very high to attack these systems, as well as the reward. We've taken valuable assets, put it into a castle, tried to build the most secure or thickest concrete wall around it, but then we also waved the huge flag above the castle saying, here's where I am, here's where all the value is, come and attack me. So that's the challenge with this model, but then what can we do instead of that model? And so in our eyes, the answer is what we call edge security, which is taking the value and securing it first at the edges on individual users' devices, or at least at most siloed away from each other. And the idea is to take data, encrypt it first on individual devices before, it's ever, before it ever hits the network and definitely before it's ever stored on a server, and make it such that the device owners are the only ones that have access to that data, until, of course, they choose to share that information. So the beauty of this model is that not only does it increase the difficulty of the attack of the entire system, it also reduces the reward from hacking. So instead of reaping an entire treasure trove of assets or data from one single attack of a server, you have, to, you have to actually attack multiple points and multiple devices. So looking at that model, you'll notice that for globally accessible internet devices, which are these centralized servers, most of them have to take both outgoing and incoming connections. And incoming connections are a point of attack. In contrast, most of our own individual devices are usually behind firewalls, and for the most part, not always, but for the most part, only do outgoing connections. They initiate the connections to the outside world. And so therefore, inherently, from a network security point of view, they're inherently more secure in that sense. And then, of course, there's the human element. As more data gets stored on any type of a system, especially if it's centralized, the more people will have to access it to secure that data to manage it. The IT infrastructure starts to increase. So as companies that store data get bigger and bigger and bigger, they'll need more people that you'll have to trust. In contrast with the edge security model, if it's secured with the credentials of one person or a few people, that is the limitation of who you generally need to trust with the credentials that can actually decrypt and access that data. So what's the kind of inherent problem with this? If this is a better model, why haven't we been doing this in the first place? So there's many tools that allow us to actually incorporate and utilize you know, edge security. So number one is client-side encryption. It's been available for years, but somewhat a challenge to use. Um, automatic data backup. So backing up of data is something that we'd like to be able to do, but for the most part, probably the average person, maybe outside of this room, doesn't incorporate data backup. Instead, we use cloud-based applications, which do it for us. Uh, synchronization of data. Uh, data synchronization tools available, once again, not really used. A revision control and data rollback. Those tools have been primarily used in cloud-based applications. Once again, the central storage of our, of our data. Uh, password recovery, very challenging with encrypted data, one of the challenges. And two-factor authentication for when you want to authenticate to get your data. All of these are great tools available to us, but for the most part, have been challenging to incorporate for the average user. And so this is kind of what we, where we come in at Airbits. 
uh, our wallet has incorporated all of these tools kind of almost from day one and made it nearly invisible to the user. So to the user, it's simple login credentials, but what's implemented underneath the covers is actually automatic encryption of data, which are private keys for Bitcoin, automatic backup of that data, automatic synchronization between devices that they're authenticated with, um, the ability to do revision control in case data gets corrupted or inadvertently changed, um, a lost password recovery option, which is definitely a challenge with encrypted data, but we've implemented a few options, and one touch, what we call one touch two factor, just a way of implementing device locking or, one, or two factor without almost any user work, no additional effort from the user to kind of gain most of its benefits. And so why is this so relevant to blockchain technology? Well, blockchain technology, starting with Bitcoin, going into other apps such as the different apps and companies I've mentioned here, all have one thing in common, is that the blockchain is the database that you need public and private keys to talk to. They don't talk to these blockchains using your username. You need public and private keys. So hence, securing private keys for these blockchain apps becomes the one common challenging problem. And if you talk to pretty much any blockchain-based application, especially the ones that aren't quite in deployment yet, they'll tell you that, yeah, that's kind of a problem we're not quite figured out how to do, and, you know, well, someone just writes down 24 words, and, well, yeah, they don't like it, but well, we'll try to figure it out later. And so this is where we definitely come in, and now we're taking the same platform that we're building our own wallet on and now deploying it for other people to use. And we're actually proud to announce that, you know, one of the, what we'd consider one of the closest uh, Ethereum apps to being in production Augur, we've inked a deal with to use Airbits to secure the private keys and authenticate their users into the platform. And so what we aim to be is actually kind of like a blockchain compatible single sign-on experience. So any app that supports the Airbits SDK, including Airbits, people could authenticate with similar credentials or identical credentials into these different apps and not have to remember multiple credentials for all the different applications or write down multiple seeds for all the different applications. So we aim to kind of take on the single sign-on market, but specifically for blockchain, and we can expand that for other web-based applications as well. And so other uses for edge security, even beyond kind of just private keys. Um, if anyone's kind of studied the Lightning Network, uh, it's a great way for us to potentially, if everything works out, and there's always some still questions, but a great way for us to scale Bitcoin and be able to do tons of transactions per second. But there's one caveat that a lot of wallets will run into is that the Lightning Network actually requires you to store and secure data with every single transaction. It's no longer good enough for you to write down 12 or 24 words and say, hey, my wallet's backed up. Now with every transaction, a little bit of data needs to be stored and secured. So every wallet that says, write these, these letters down and you're good, that's no longer true. And so any projects that are looking at being implemented in the Lightning Network can actually utilize Erebus as a way to store that transactional info that you need to secure in case a device is lost. As well, uh, BIP 20, actually, I think I wrote down 27, but I think it's BIP 47. I could be wrong, someone correct me. But uh, anonymous payment codes, kind of a, a, a post project to uh, stealth addresses. That also has a little bit of data that should be saved um, that will tell you where payments codes came from, where payments came from, and who you paid uh, from a payment code. So we're excited about these future protocols. These are two of the ones that I'm actually most excited about that we'd like to implement, even in the core of our SDK. Um, but of course, they definitely require a fundamental shift in the way we manage the data for, for Bitcoin and cryptocurrency wallets. And so for you developers out there, I just want to show you what it kind of looks like to use Airbits um, in your app. And so I'm more or less more iPhone oriented of a developer. So in about four lines of code, of course, a line is arguable. You can simply create an instance of Airbits core by just initializing it with one line of code, uh, create an account, you pass one line of code which has a username, a password, and a PIN, and that creates an account in the system which actually creates data on the device, encrypts that data, and backs it up. And you could call one line which is a data write. And here I write um, a key value pair, such as the phone number of a user, and I write the actual phone number. So it's a simple key value store is really what um, the edge security model is. And so that key value store could be a private key, it could be metadata for an application, it could be other account information, any sensitive data that you only want the user to have access to. And then with respect to device to device synchronization, you could be on another device and if the account already exists, you can access the account via password login, there's the username, the password, and then read back the data. 
right? to say, what's the key? And grab back the, the value. And so this value happens to be a string of the user's phone number, and you can print that out. So as simple as that. So that is what we feel is the core value proposition to most blockchain-based applications. So simply just data security in a simple, streamlined way. However, the SDK also, since we kind of started off as a full Bitcoin wallet, incorporates full Bitcoin transaction functionality. It's very kind of wallet-oriented, almost like a PayPal simple API. And it supports mul multiple HD wallets, it generates public addresses, um, it's got a full BIP21 URI generator, QR code generator, allows you to send to multiple address targets. It supports the public-private key authentication protocol, BitID, which I think I talked about, I was on a panel here a few months ago about that. Uh, has a currency conversion library with over 150 uh, currencies, uh, supporting I think five different exchange rate sources. And using our data security model, it also lets you tag each transaction that occurred in the wallet with metadata, such as payee, category, and notes. So looking quickly at what that API looks like, it could be as simple as taking someone's account, which you created you know, in a previous code, and creating a wallet. And you can have multiple wallets per account. It's one line of code to create an account. You specify the type of currency uh, tied to that account. And then you, rec you create a receive address, which is just another Bitcoin address. And this kind of block of code in the middle that says pay, name, category, and notes, that's Airbit's metadata, right, using the edge security model. And so you can take this address that you've pulled out of the SDK and say, if money hits this address, automatically tag it with bit awesome and a category of income sales, and in the notes we'll call it you know, a foot massage, whatever you'd like. And so whenever money hits that address, it'll automatically have that metadata tag for it. And then once you've created that request, you can just read out from the request, what's the address of this request, what's the full BIP21 URI, and what's a QR code in the native image format of the platform you're using. <clears throat> and then to send Bitcoin just as easy, take the current wallet, create a spend object, and add an address and a Satoshi amount, and then go ahead and send it off. So we try to make kind of Bitcoin wallet type of transactions fairly simple. Admittedly, this is less of what I would call a, a blockchain API and SDK. Like we don't currently yet have the ability to write into op returns and to do like tokenized assets and more complex things like that, although it's something that we're looking at adding. Right now we're focusing on, instead of really incorporating a lot of blockchain functionality, really be the key management solution for other apps, and they do their own type of blockchain functionality. And so what else can we do with kind of uh, edge security? I kind of mentioned briefly BitID, um, but just to kind of really, really hammer that home, I'm very, very excited about public-private key authentication. I think that's a piece that, of all the pieces of blockchain tech that people are getting excited about, this is one piece that really can apply across the board to all companies, financial institutions, insurance, Bitcoin companies, you name it, because it fundamentally shifts um, a lot of the, the usability of having to deal with multiple, multiple usernames and passwords across many systems. It shifts that into a much more usable experience, but also a more secure experience, and more importantly, much more auditable experience. I know a lot of technologists here, you know, if you access your um, like, uh, virtual servers, you probably do, throw th do so through SSH, and that provides a nice audit trail. You know who accessed it because people own their private keys, and you can see in a log that they access the system. Well, this could be true for pretty much all systems, especially in financial services, where there can be an audit trail of who accessed it because they own their own private keys. And it just hasn't been that way for a lot of systems because people haven't had great tools for uh, controlling their own private keys. As well, there's many different other uses for edge security, even beyond the blockchain and beyond public and private keys. Uh, we're excited about uses for information that is stored, generated, transmitted through IoT applications. Uh, financial applications like the Quickens and QuickBooks of the world, being able to process financial information but do it in a way that's totally private to the user, which is what we built. Our platform is fully private in that sense. Healthcare records. A lot of companies are excited about healthcare records and securing them with the blockchain. Ironically, the blockchain is kind of terrible for securing information by default. What it's good at is proving authenticity of information but a lot has to happen to help secure the information. But actually, you could use Airbit's Edge Security to secure the data and use a blockchain to make sure that it's authentic. That's one option as well. <clears throat> and so some future functionality that we're working on, hopefully within the next quarter or two, uh, support for JavaScript, and that's actually coming up pretty soon, Windows support. Um, individual repo sharing, so this is powerful. This allows an account, 
which has encrypted data, to create silos of data that can be shared with other accounts or different apps. So that way I can take my Orbitz wallet and create an account or a silo of encrypted data to another blockchain app, but give that blockchain app only access to that silo and so that it doesn't have access to encrypted data from other applications using my account credentials. So individual repo sharing. On the back end of our system, we actually use Git. So when I say repo, I, I literally mean repo. These data, data silos are using Git repos, and that's where we get the revision control capability of, of, uh, of Airbits. But it also allows us to say, well, this repo is specifically for this um, one purpose, and you can share it between apps or between users. Uh, native Lightning Network support, obviously, since we're excited about that, and end-to-end -end encrypted mes messaging as well. It's needed for a few other purposes, and so we'd like to deploy that in the SDK so people can use that to communicate between users of an app. And so what people do know us as is a mobile wallet for Bitcoin, and it's an open source app that's built on the Airbits SDK, and everyone is welcome to use it as the template for how you can use our SDK. And so that's it's a great starting point. We have some companies using it all from the, the full top to bottom as a white-labeled app to using it as a template to build their own app to just using it as the demo of how to use our SDK. And we'd like to say that it is using our security platform to secure private keys, to secure metadata for the transactions, to secure the authentication credentials to connect to exchanges because you can buy and sell inside of the app through third-party exchanges, and to secure gift cards. <clears throat> and so we've actually built to do the exchanges and gift cards in addition to the SDK that you can put into your app, we have an API in order to put your app inside of our mobile app, inside of Airbits. So as an example, there is a plugin API that we've got in JavaScript, and it allows us to write apps such as a buy-sell um, exchange plugin. So we have a couple of those for two different exchanges so that in the app people can buy Bitcoin in, you know, through two different companies, and then also buy gift cards through our partner Fold and that uses our plugin API. So anyone developing an app that, especially if it's already in HTML and JavaScript, you could probably port that app really simply into a plugin that works inside of Airbits and get a little bit more traction, marketing, and customers leveraging our user base uh, to be able to access your service. <clears throat> and that's effectively it, folks. Um, that's our platform. Uh, right now it's, it's available on iOS, Android, Mac, soon to be Linux, and like I said, we're gonna be uh, working on a Windows version and a native JavaScript version for it as well. Thanks, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, round of applause, thank you. So we have uh, some time for questions, so I'm gonna ask you guys to use the microphone, because we're doing the recording, and uh, it helps to transmit the sound through. Um, I have a quick question, and it didn't get spoken about. I saw, yeah. <laughs> um, I saw that you were talking about there was a uh, native support for Lightning Network in there. Can you talk about where, what that's going to look like and maybe quickly what is Lightning Network in case people here are not aware? So I mentioned future support. So we would definitely like to support the Lightning Network. It's one of the protocols we're most excited about and one that fits very nicely in our security model. Uh, we don't have support in it yet. What it's going to look like will highly depend on what the library um, looks like, but having talked to Joseph Poon, it looks like a library that he's working on would be something that could be easily implemented in our platform. And our platform natively is written in C++, actually. And so with the goal of providing C binding for the Lightning Network, that would fit in very well for us. Thank you. Okay, so I have two questions. One is, what is the target of encryption? Keys or data? The question was, what is the target? Oh, the target of encryption. Oh, what is the type of encryption? Okay, so we use script password. Passwords, passwords, Correct. Keys, passwords. Correct, so um, usernames and passwords are strongly hashed depending on the device speed. We actually time the device to determine how strong we can crank up the, the password hashing on that device. And we double hash usernames and passwords once for authentication with our system, and then a second time with a different salt, so you can call it a salt, but a different hash that actually encrypts a master key that master key is a full random number, which then encrypts the data with AES-256. Okay, so the other question is, uh, so when we use a uh, public key for the authentication, so that's right, so you use a uh, public key or private key for authentication. Mm -hmm. So when we use uh, some kind of public key cryptography, so we use some kind of trust model like a PKI or BGP like sort of trust model. Mm -hmm. So what, which kind of trust model we, we, you choose? Okay, so you could, of course, store your own private keys in any format inside of the SDK. 
and you know, use the same edge security model. What's built into the SDK is BitID's uh, public-private key authentication model, which actually is exactly the same as Bitcoin. It takes the exact same elliptic, curve as, like elliptic curves as Bitcoin and uses that to authenticate. And that's an open protocol. We didn't, we didn't develop it, but we do support it. And that is supported by, I believe, Mycelium and Ledger Wallet, and the CryptoKit is developing support for it as well. Vulnerability standpoint of view, you're, you're, you know, if you were to implement Airbit, Airbit uh, this, this protocol or the scheme, you're still dependent that your service is up and running. So if there's a denial of service attack, you have to go away, your server is down, will that basically shut down the service? Is that a vulnerability? So we try to have a graceful fallback, depending on what, so the, the question is what are the vulnerabilities if we go away, if we have a D, DDoS attack and whatnot. So what are our weak points? We try to be as client-side as possible, which is why we're, I keep saying we're an SDK, 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 although technically an SDK and API are interchangeable. People think of APIs as server-based um, APIs versus SDKs as software that go in your system. So we're heavily, heavily client-side based. So if we go down, you could still log in to an account if it's been logged into that device before. That actually does work. You can actually download Airbits today, create an account, log out, put your, your phone onto airplane mode and log back in. So there, the pieces that don't work, we have a pin-based login, and that's a split key method where we take a key, break it in half, and put half of it on a server, half of it on the device. That's used for kind of fast login repeatedly. Um, and so since pins are not good enough for encryption, they're just too low entropy, we use it as a way to authenticate, send back the other half of the key, decrypt locally. That wouldn't work if our servers were down. In the same sense, we have two types of servers. Actually, interesting you say that, because. One of my appendix slides <laughs> happens to be the next slide, and, and I was uh, going to cut off the presentation. But we have kind of a three server type of architecture. One very centralized authentication server, and that's our standard kind of SQL database. It holds hashed usernames and passwords and an encrypted package. The package is encrypted with a hash of the username and password, uh, a different hash, so we can't decrypt it. In there is a pointer to the synchronization servers, and those are fully peer to peer. So the nice thing is that those can go, if any number of those go down, so long as at least one is up, you can still synchronize between different devices. So that's kind of our distributed nature at work, our belief in decentralization as much as we can build it. And in the same sense, if you're implementing our blockchain functionality, you're actually using Airbits to send and receive Bitcoin. Well, we connect directly to Bitcoin nodes. So we support Obelisk and Electrum nodes. So Obelisk with Bitcoin, it's kind of an interchangeable name, and then Electrum slash Stratum, those two are kind of equivalent as well. So the nice thing is Airbits can be 100% down. All of our servers can go down, and from a Bitcoin transaction functionality, you can still send and receive Bitcoin. Um, however, like you said, there's definitely pieces of the functionality that don't work. You can't create new, new accounts, you can't create new data silos or wallets. You wouldn't be able to do pin-based login as well. Um, but like I said, a lot of the functionality does still work. So um, um, when we talk about Bitcoin, we talk about Ethereum, we talk about public networks, we're often talking about the, relying on the, the, the power of consensus. And when we look at the server side, especially in a host environment, uh, one worries a little bit about who you're hosting with, who your VM ma manager is, mm -hmm. and uh, whether that encrypted, whether you're secure private keys are in the clear between the core of the stack and, and, mm -hmm. and your runtimes. Um, is your solution deal with that at Yeah, absolutely. So we assume that all servers are compromised. And so our SDK is fully visible. You could, it's on GitHub, it's open source, you can check it out, and you can see that nothing leaves the device or actually even gets saved on the device until it's been encrypted with user credentials. And so definitely, once it's sent out onto the network, we assume that the network is compromised. And by the time it's hitting the network, it's already been encrypted before it's even saved. So our infrastructure is basically dummy storage backup. It doesn't know what the data is at all. We don't know if it's private keys in there or if it's just you know, someone's email address that you're storing on behalf of your application. That's been our fundamental kind of belief system from the very, very get-go. Now, the nice thing is the way we've kind of architected this is the sync servers are the ones that hold like the bulk of the data. Those are the Git repositories. They have provision control rollback. They're kind of the um, bit more expensive piece of the, the puzzle. 
Um, however, the data that's on those servers, is only data on there is encrypted with full 256-bit keys. So there's nothing to brute force. It's cryptographically secure data on the synchronization servers. The kind of the weakest point would be the authentication servers, which have hash, hashed usernames and passwords. The nice thing is that's a very, very lightweight, cheap server. And so we can put as much energy as possible to securing that thing and not have to deal with putting a ton of security around a lot of data. You could put as much kind of basic enterprise, you know, you know the standard enterprise security around that one server. Um, but even then, it's still a, a needle in a haystack problem. You don't actually know where the value is because even if you could brute force the usernames and passwords, you don't know which one has any value because at the core of our platform, we don't ask for any emails. There's no phone numbers. There's no real names. And without that information, it's hard to, to, to find what accounts to try to brute force. So it's about not just security by technology, but we believe in the concept of security by game theory. Right? There's, there's very little incentive. You don't know what to, what to attack. Yeah, so that's cool. And, uh, but that's not a lot like network security. Um, what about the security so on the device, that's definitely something that's a bit out of, out of our control, but we fundamentally believe that a lot of the technology, on, especially on mobile devices, is improving. The security of mobile devices went from kind of not great to some of the most secure devices we have today that are consumer accessible versus like, you know, um, very solid hardware wallets. What if so. there was a server on Azure? So agree, totally agree if that was a server. So we don't encourage this being used on a server. It's as simple as that. This is a client-side application um, SDK. So it's meant to secure at the edge. Not that it's impossible. You could, especially, and really, what's the definition of a server or a client? If you put a server behind a firewall and it's running in your office, then, well, that's still better than a globally accessible internet server. Right? So that it's a gray area. It's not a fine line between client and server. But it can be done. Hello, hi. Oh. Uh, me, Barton. Uh, I, while you were talking and presenting your, uh, the, uh, uh, the presentation, I was downloading, and it came the icon of Bitcoin with Airbnb, so I push it on, and it's telling me I have a user. I, uh, I have a user account for this. So my question is how do, uh, how this application know that I have a user account? So our system uses a global you know, database, or not global, but it has one central database of usernames. So there's a chance if you were trying to log in or create an account and someone already has that username, then it was already taken. It, it's simple as that. Just like an email with Gmail. If someone's already taken the, your, your email address on Gmail, then you wouldn't be able to create it. So you just have to choose a username that's not already taken. Just on the point that you made, I think Ledger they, they do something with like the custom execution environment for Samsung devices and so on. So maybe that's something you guys look at. But that, there's two areas I think that you guys could uh, what might be good features is one is some kind of disaster recovery where something could actually supply a real world ID that can retrieve that package. Uh, I know it may not apply to all use cases, but for many people, some enterprise may be the case of their security requirements uh, are high, but they still need to. Got it. So to address the issue, the I don't know, question slash statement that was mentioned, uh, suggesting having some disaster recovery where someone has to provide a tremendous amount of personal information to be able to recover the keys. So in our take, almost any implementation of that effectively means that you're not really using edge security or you're doing a trust model because somebody holds those keys. One way of implementing something similar to that, which we're pursuing, um, one is. Uh, our, uh, we already have an aspect of password recovery in the app. Admittedly, it's still a bit high friction. It uses answers to, um, you know, kind of security questions as a secondary password that can decrypt data. But they have to be fairly high entropy because they actually are decryption keys. Um, a model that we're developing is to take a split key model where we take a key and break it in half. We hold one half of the key. The user holds another half that they've maybe emailed to themselves, and the security questions are no longer an encryption key, they're just an authentication method into our system. And that can get them back the other half of the key. A corollary to that even further is where we have several parties hold like a Shamir secret split key. 
and you authenticate with each individual party, and, and the parties might not even know who the other parties are. That to me is ideal, where it's split between several parties and you have one key that you maybe email to yourself. That key tells you also who the other parties are and you can supply you know, some personal information to them and then parts of a key get, get returned. And I believe I had talked to one of, uh, I think it was uh, Ben over at BitGo and had suggested the idea of doing not multi-signature signatures, but instead um, simply data store, like holding part of a key and then authenticating the way you normally would for a multi-sig transaction, but instead authenticating and then getting the data back. And that effectively, if we had enough parties doing that, we could implement data recovery in a kind of very distributed manner. And that's what I think is one of the futures of being able to do recovery of keys in, that, in this sense. But we just haven't implemented that. There aren't, to my understanding, enough parties offering it. Um, but we'll, we'll add as we see uh, fit. Uh, that was a quick follow-up. This discussion we had before. Uh, your bit ID uh, underlying that uh, you're using the uh, basically Bitcoin's uh, sort of protocol. You're using the K1 code. Are you able to change that over time? For example, the industry moving forward, they're going for going to buy by one now. A lot of lots of people doing it. Lots of people coming out of it. And actually, the K1 code is only used in Bitcoin and Bitcoin derived uh, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin and Ethereum. And outside of the cryptocurrency space, no one's using it. And everyone refers to it as a government mandated one. So, you use several solutions. Do you think you'd be able to add other data platforms online to the ID of the time, or is it sort of locked in? I mean, nothing's really ever locked in. It's a matter of just changing the code um, and then also having to change the different, potentially change the services that you've already kind of authenticated with. So, registering new public keys with those services. But, API stuff, that's I mean, we could extend the API and say, okay, you're not using bit ID, you know, you're using. Um, some other format, I can't remember some of the other names, but yeah, it's, it's not super challenging. It's just, that's what we've chosen to support, number one, because we want other wallets to support it also, and it's the easiest protocol for wallets to support because they already have support for it by supporting Bitcoin. And so I fundamentally feel like the one thing that's hindered um, public-private key authentication solutions, many other apps have come out with this, is that they haven't had a very good target demographic to, to kind of push this initiative on. So much like I think Facebook succeeded because they took a very targeted demographic that wanted that product and then expanded afterwards. I think we actually have a very, very unique opportunity in the Bitcoin cryptocurrency space to push public private key authentication because so many people already have wallets. They already have wallets that are already capable of doing public private key signatures and that, uh, they're, that already are securing private keys. And so just getting everybody in this space to adopt that form of authentication could help it bleed out into other industries as well. And so that's why I was excited about BitID, not because it's you know, amazingly better than the other solutions. It's what I consider to be good enough and also very adoptable to the right demographic. Uh, you mentioned uh, two-factor, can you expand on that? Sure, so we've implemented, and this is a debatable piece of our tech, what we call one touch two factor. And it's very focused on two factor that you would use in a mobile device. We've definitely had people argue this, this case, but we've taken the Google Authenticator model, I mean, literally at per spec, and implemented that inside of the SDK. And so all it's doing is it's taking an app and a second app, which is the Google Authenticator, and folding it into one. And that's simply it. And normally you'd have to enable two factor inside your app and then take this code that's generated and copy it into Google Authenticator. And then every time you log in, you'd have to actually copy this changing six digit number and paste it into your app and then log in. We basically fold it into one and it does it for you in the background. That's basically it. So it's simple, it's elegant, it achieves what I consider to be 90 to 95% of the security with none of the frustrations of the, for the user, almost none. Like nothing's perfect, but it's simply go to settings, enable it, and you're done. Every time you authenticate, it just happens in the background. And so that's effectively what we built. And it's, a, it's also available in the SDK. Are there any more questions there? All right, I'll keep these last two. Um, are, are you working on a Ether wallet? And also, would you consider integrating one name into the SDK? Or are you uh, hoping that people use the title? 
Okay, so the question was, are we working on Ether Wallet? Um, and what do we think about one name? Do we prefer bid ID to one name? Blah, 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 something like that. And, or would we prefer, yeah, I think that was the main gist of the question. And so we're not working on an Ethereum wallet right now. What we would like to do is power an Ethereum wallet with our security model so people could authenticate with it without having to back it up separately from their Urban's wallet. Um, similar to how we're working with Augur, which is Ethereum based. Right? In a way, that is an Ethereum wallet. Um, now, bid ID versus one name, I think they solve two different things. So, one name solves the public address to name resolution, bid ID is authenticating with your, public, your private key. So those, I think, are kind of complementary technologies. And I'm all for public address to name resolution. I think that's a generally good th thing from a user experience point of view, because we don't have to then scan QR codes and write down public addresses. But I fundamentally won't support public address to name resolution until we have more anonymous public addresses, such as stealth addresses or payment codes. So that's why I mentioned payment codes, because I'm excited about that tech. Not so much because it's like anonymous hide from people, but because we can finally implement a like, DNS for Bitcoin that associates to an address that doesn't give up all, all the transactions that ever went to that address the way something like one name would. And so to me, we need to be at least as private as the Visa network. And right now, one name with a public address makes all your transactions very, very visible to your peers, which I think is like a, a definite step backwards. Um, for authentication, what is the time budget typically around Crick and flow from mobile to DOS server? I'm sorry, from so a... When we're, when we're talking DOS server, I mean, you've got a certain amount of time it's going to take. And some, so you've got one server there. I mean, are you actually giving some sort of SLA on this model if we use this API? Well, it's not physically one server. It's centralized and it has, like, you know, okay, it has... Serve the service. Stuff. I mean, you have an SLA that you're going to deliver? Um, we're happy to consider. We haven't thought of it very, very specifics with, as far as the amount of authentications. The beauty of our model is that you actually don't need the server to authenticate other than the first time. So it's much more scalable in that well, except, regard. Except the PIN code model. I mean, just imagine yeah. using PIN code. PIN code is one model. The thing that we're finding most people use is actually um, the secure element on like iPhone. So the nice thing is that actually doesn't need our server. So that's actually taking the keys to decrypt, storing them inside of the secure element, and using that to decrypt the data locally. And so as we support that on other devices, such as on Android, that actually alleviates even more of the, the, the bandwidth burden to our server. Okay. Good. It's just something to think about is in every yeah. service we use, we've got to actually allocate a budget of time right. for every API we call. Correct. And we try to minimize that as much as possible in the same spirit of not wanting um, companies and projects to be dependent on us. But very good point, it's something that we should kind of study because the server does have work to do on a full authentication. Cool. Great, thank you, Paul. All right, thanks everybody.